Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger. Uh, we're missing Brian Broom for a while. I'm not sure when he'll be back, but I hope he will be. We're talking... Be- because Brian is... Because Brian just got married, so I didn't even invite him to join the Skype call because (laughs) he should be on his honeymoon and not on a call with us. There you go. There we go. So we've been talking about, we've been in the series called A Mother in Israel, right? We're talking about Deborah and Jael, and this phrase is used one other time in the Old Testament, correct? Just the one. Only one that I remember, Mm -hmm. Um, although... The idea appears a number of, a number of times. Mm-hmm. There is an obscure little story in Second Samuel about a woman who doesn't call herself a mother in Israel. She calls her city a mother in Israel. And this is how that story goes. This is from Second Samuel 20. What's happened is David has been on the run from Absalom, but battle has been joined. Absalom is dead. His army is defeated. And um, there's confusion about whether or not David's going to return to the throne. And a man named Sheba decides to stir the pot and say, well, nobody will have David. What's every man to his tent, Israel? So he starts his own little insurrection. There's some other details along the way. But Joab comes back, grabs a bunch of guys and chases him all the way through Israel. And this is, we'll pick up the text there in verse 14. And he went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel, unto Bethmeica, and all the the Berites, and they were gathered together and went also after him. And they came and besieged him in Abel of Bethmeica. And they cast up a bank against the city, and it stood in the trench. And all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Then cried a wise woman out of the city, here, here, say, I pray unto, I, I pray you say unto Joab, come near hither that I may speak with thee. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear the words of thy handmaid. He said, I do hear. Then she spake, saying, They were wont to speak in old time, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel. And so they ended the matter. I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Now seek us to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? So what's happened is Joab and his guys have laid siege to the city. They've begun battering the walls. And and somehow the people on the inside don't get why this is happening. They just have closed up their, their city and locked the doors. And they know there's a besieging army. But this older woman is, is a little unclear as to exactly what's going on. So she goes up on the wall and calls out to some random soldier and says, Get Joab. I need to find out what's going on here. Parley. And Joab. Parley. <laughs> and Joab comes and they have some nice words. And, and the woman describes the, the condition of her city. They were wont to speak in all that. Needless to say, they shall surely ask counsel at Abel. Proverb, meme. Um, <laughs> uh, apparently, this city had a reputation for having very wise people in it. And when they couldn't figure out anything else, people would drop over to Abel and get <laughs> advice from the older generation there. So, you know, we, we got a history, we have a heritage, we have a reputation. And here you are trying to destroy our city. And she describes the city as a mother in Israel. And that's what we're going to come talk about in just a second. And she asked Joab, why are you, why are you trying to swallow up the Lord's inheritance? Why are you trying to destroy the city and all that it stands for, which is in her mind a great deal? Joab answered and said, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. The matter is not so, but a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only and I will depart from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. <laughs> Hang on a second. I'll go get it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get his head. And she does not offer to open the city gates. Mm-hmm. She just says, Oh, that's it. Well, then we'll take off his head and throw it to you, and you can be on your way. Thank you very much. 
Um, and she does. The I little woman. Hmm? It's it's interesting that she has such an esteem for her city. Like this is not a city of a special spiritual significance that I know of. Right? No, this we is have not, not really heard anything else about it. Right. So, but, but it's a great thing to her to stand yeah. up for her city and say, "Hey, we have a great tradition here." And I'm not really crazy about you destroying it. So I'm going to take some <laughs> brave action to make sure that we can carry on here. Yeah. And and she has such confidence of, um, oh, that's all you need? We'll take, we'll take off his... She doesn't even debate how this is going to happen. We will <laughs> simply... We will, we will take off his head and it will be thrown to you. <laughs> so she, I love this next line. Then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom. Mm. And uh, they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, cast it out to Joab. He blew the trumpet. They retired from the city, every man to his ten. Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. So that ended that military coup, right, real fast. <laughs> we do not know who this woman was. We do not know her name. Uh, generally, there were not civil offices that a woman would fill. It's not a royal city, so she's not a princess or a queen or any such thing. I don't remember it being a Levitical city. Uh, she may be a prophetess, but she's not called such. She just seems to be a wise, she's called a wise woman. Probably older, but we're not told how much older. What we know about her is she's bold. When everybody else is confused, she sees straight to the solution. Well, I'll go talk to him and see what's <laughs> going on then. Uh, and she does. She's loud. <laughs> she can make her voice heard. Um, Joab, she has the ear of all the people. Yeah. And and, and she says, I, I will. She knows that what she says is going to happen, mm -hmm. not because of any personal or legal authority, but because it's obviously the right thing. Mm -hmm. Her city is wise. Once she fills them in and points out what needs to be done, obviously they will go along with it. She assumes she will be heard, that her voice will be recognized, that her wisdom will be recognized. And when she goes, yeah, she goes to all the people in her wisdom uh, and says, look, this guy tried to stage a coup. He's a traitor to the king. What more do you need to know? Uh, probably Sheba said something at this point. It, there is nothing good he could have said that would have helped. <laughs> um, well, yeah, because David's this and David's that. Okay, well, there you got your testimony. Do we need anything <laughs> yeah. else? Should have um, pled the fifth. <laughs> yeah. You know, should, this would be a good time for lying, but he, he <laughs> couldn't come up with that. And so they simply grab him and take off his head and throw it over the wall. And again, not opening the, the, the gates of the city because the Joab doesn't necessarily have the greatest reputation. He's a powerful warrior, to be sure. Honesty and integrity, yeah, you know. So <laughs> let's just let's just send it by airmail and um <laughs> and 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 that'll be that. So on the on the one hand, we should point to this woman. She is something of a mother in Israel. She does not uh, put on battle armor and take on either Joab or Sheba. She uses her age and wisdom effectively. She gives good advice to people who will listen. She obviously has earned the right to be listened to. Mm -hmm. She is a wise woman. And Abel's a city known for wisdom. So one, one thing about, about wise people, about wise men, is they listen to other wise people. <laughs> you, you, you learn when you have wisdom, you learn to shut up and listen to other people who also have wisdom. And, and you hear them out. And so the elders of this city know this woman. They know she, she speaks wise things. She, they, they, they listen to her voice. And the fact that she's not an elder is irrelevant. She communicates effectively what needs to be done. They register, yeah, she's absolutely right. We need to do that. And then they do it. But our focus here is on what she calls her city. She calls her city a mother in Israel. Now, you were telling me before we started that you've run into this concept of a heavenly mother. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us something about that? Yeah, this happened to me multiple times back in Maryland where I had different women come up to me in the grocery store or walking down the street and invite me to their Bible study to hear about the Heavenly Mother. 
Mm. which I, I think is a reference to Galatians 4.26, which says, Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Mm-hmm. And of course, my my red flags go up. I'm thinking, okay, so you've discovered a new truth. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you have. So I, I sort of say, oh, that's interesting. Where where do you get that in the Bible? And we have a brief conversation. But mostly I never see these women again, so I don't <laughs> think too much more about it. But I did find out through um, a channel on YouTube, uh, Mike Winger, I think is his name. I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's spelled like wing like a bird. Er, And he talks about different cults and he mentions uh, this cult of the the mother god. So I just I found out that's who they were, but I haven't looked into it much more than that. But so that is the association that I have with this verse, which I have a feeling <laughs> is not entirely correct. <laughs> n- n- no, no. Uh, of course, this has this has been an age that has seen the rebirth of the goddess. Mm-hmm. The bumper stickers tell us the goddess of, is alive and magic is afoot and things like that. I've never to this point seen it connected with anything in the Bible. It's usually very anti-biblical. God as father is um, evil and violent and demanding and the source of all problems. Whereas the mother goddess is good and we know her by intuition and emotion. She's ecologically friendly and kind and sweet and, and all that. Trying to pick Jerusalem above, the new Jerusalem, as a um, counterbalancing goddess in the Christian religion. That's, that, <laughs> that one's new. That one I have not heard of before. That's what's going on here. Yeah, I, I am interested in the fact that people kept picking on you. Did yeah, you read some kind of sign? I mean, there was just something in your forehead, like victim or something. <laughs> a vibe? I don't know. <laughs> but apparently, it's quite a growing thing um, from yeah. from what I can tell. As I said, I haven't looked into it too much. Yeah. Um, but I think probably it was a regional thing, that there were more missionaries of this cult in that region than there are in our current region. Yeah, California's got enough weirdness. It's hard to even get a follow here for anything. <laughs> Too terribly do. <laughs> true. We have all the old stuff. But um, the passage you referred to, and, and it would be good, it's it's in Galatians 4. And I'll read some of what's going on here. Paul is summing up his arguments or, or giving them a, a, an analogical expression by pointing back to Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. He says to the... Uh, those who are defecting from the true gospel to a gospel of circumcision, of works righteousness. Tell me that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it's written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise. Uh, what Paul is, he, he says allegory, but what he doesn't mean it didn't happen. He means that in this history, there is a spiritual principle being worked out into the open so we can see it. Abram had a promise from God. And the promise involved a seed. When he talked this over with Sarah, somehow together they came up with the idea that maybe Sarah was not, since Sarah was not by name at this point included, and that she was too old to bear a child by any natural process. She was at that stage alive. That Obviously, God intended that that Abram take a new wife. And there was a young slave girl named Hagar from out of Egypt. Uh, and Sarah pointed her out and said, will you take her? And then she'll get pregnant. She'll have a baby. I'll adopt the baby. I'm sure that's how God means to provide you with a seed. And Abraham, to his eternal discredit, went along with this. But it didn't go so well. Uh, although Abram loved his son, Isaac or Ishmael, the child by Hagar. He's not the child of the promise. That was not how God planned on doing it. God, from the beginning, had said, one man, one woman, forever, that's marriage. You don't need to be getting second marriages. You don't need to be breaking God's law in order to get God's blessing. 
even doing breaking God's law in the name of keeping God's law. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't. No, don't do that. <laughs> And, Although and Ishmael did receive the sign of the promise, which I think is he, very interesting. He did receive the sign of the promise. He was circumcised. He was placed, he was recognized as being within the covenant, mm -hmm. received the mark of the covenant. And for several years, well, until his teenage years, was raised as a child of the covenant uh, until Abraham understood, oh, no, it's supposed to be a child with my proper wife, my first wife. Sarah, and when they got over themselves and, and simply trusted God for the miracle, Sarah brought forth a child, Isaac, and um, God said, that's that's the child, and Isaac shall they see be called. Well, when Isaac came of age, Ishmael kind of made fun at, of him. Sarah sees this and says, this is not going to work. Get rid of the bondwoman, get rid of her son. The, bond, the son of the bondwoman will not be heir with my, my son mm -hmm. Isaac. And although this grieved Abram a great deal, Ab God confirmed the message that no, she is right. And it's, you, 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 basically, you screwed this up. You got to live with the consequences of this one. <laughs> now, that does not mean that Isaac was necessarily ungodly. In fact, the text in Genesis says that God was with him, uh, which is some of the irony here. Here is what God is, what uh, Paul is saying to the people in Galatia is, yeah, Abraham has many children. Many of them have been circumcised. That does not make them children of God. What makes them children of God is faith in the promise. So just as Ishmael was a natural descendant of Abraham, just as he bore the seed of the promise, and yet became a true child of God only by faith, so you Jews can be a child of the promise in the same way. In other words, Jews are now in the category of Arabs. <laughs> that was not calculated to win any votes from anybody. <laughs> no. But that is what he is saying. Israel today stands in the same category as Ishmael. Genetically, biologically descended from Abraham, mark with the sign of the promise, but without faith, not truly children of Abraham in, in the biblical sense. Now, <laughs> said all that to say this. <laughs> the covenant principles they were operating on, when, when Abram went to Hagar, he and Hagar and Sarah were all thinking in terms of what works righteousness and the religion of the flesh. If we do stuff that we are naturally capable of doing, if we, if we are good and do good stuff, God will bless us. Well, that's a false gospel. And Hagar, as a mom, represents that way of trying to get God's blessing. But so does the Jerusalem of Paul's day, the Jerusalem that murdered the prophets, that crucified Christ, that persecuted Paul. That city that then was and was in bondage with her children, though it bore the name Jerusalem, was Egypt and Sodom. It was Babylon the Great. It was a whore that propagated a false religion. Could it become, could it return to God's blessing? Yes, by repenting and embracing the true Messiah by faith and rejecting all claims, whether they be um, biological and genetic or whether they be ceremonial or whether they be cultural heritage. All of that in itself doesn't save us. And so over against that Jerusalem, now we finally come to it, Paul speaks of a different Jerusalem. He says, the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. And then he takes a prophecy from Isaiah 54, because it, it, at once, it's, it, it's, this theme is something that the Bible assumes throughout, but it doesn't develop in one place in any great detail. It just kind of assumes that we've been paying attention <laughs> from the beginning. This is the prophecy. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords, strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be, con thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore, for thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. 
And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, as a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith the Lord. For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. And, and it goes on and talks about the city. As we, the metaphor shifts from being a woman to a city. I will lay thy stones with fair colors, thy foundations with sapphire. We'll make thy windows of agates, thy gates of carbuncles. But then it shifts back to, and thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children, and so on. So this is what Paul applies to the Jerusalem which is above. And so the question is, what's the Jerusalem which is above? <laughs> well, the big hint here from Isaiah is that this, this Jerusalem is someone, something that produces children to God, that in fact, God calls his wife his bride. Now, if we happen to have read through Ephesians and Revelation <laughs> and the rest of the Bible, okay, now we can put the pieces together. He's talking about the New Covenant Church, or in a broader sense, true believers of all ages, climaxing, culminating in the New Covenant Church. Well, the question is, why does he call it the Jerusalem which is above? Because the church seems awfully much to be on earth. Mm -hmm. um, Calvin says this, this is his, Galatia, his commentaries on, on Galatians 4.26. The Jerusalem which he calls above or heavenly is not contained in heaven, nor are we to seek for it out of this world. For the church is spread over the whole world and is a stranger and pilgrim on the earth. Why then is it said to be from heaven? Because it originates in heavenly grace. For the sons of God are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. The heavenly Jerusalem, which derives its origin from heaven and dwells above by faith, is the mother of believers. To the church, under God, we owe it that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And from her we obtain the milk and the food by which we are afterwards nourished. Such are the reasons why the church is called the mother of believers. And certainly he who refuses to be a son of the church in vain desires to have God as his father. Mm -hmm. For it is only through the instrumentality of the church that we are born of God and brought up to the various stages of childhood and youth till we arrive at manhood. The designation, the mother of us all, reflects the highest credit and the highest honor on the church. There's a lot there. Mm -hmm. he, he, he says that it's not called heavenly because it's in heaven. I, I, I would differ just a little bit with him. I would say it's not all there. <laughs> there is a good portion of it that is there. <laughs> <laughs> a good portion of the church actually is in heaven and our king is in heaven. So, uh, and, and right now, given how many ages have passed, it may be that the majority of the church is currently in heaven. It may, it may not always be that way, but right now it kind of seems that way. Anyway, a large contingent of the church is in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. But the church in heaven, we, 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 we can't return calls. <laughs> um, they don't talk to us, nor do we talk to them. We can talk to Jesus. He's on the throne. But the church, insofar is, as it is a mother to us in the present, is the church on earth. Now, the church in heaven has laid up rich treasures for us. We have the confessions and the creeds, and we have the hymns, we have the sermons, we have the traditions. We still draw on the things that believers in past ages have done, and in that sense, that continues to nourish us. But the odds are that the, the, the person who brought any one of us to Christ is someone who, at least at that point, was alive and on earth. <laughs> May still be alive and on earth. Mm -hmm. Although I'm getting up in years. So um, the basic figure of a mother is a mother produces children. That's almost the definition. Now, we associate a great many other things with a good mother. Mm -hmm. And so does scripture, rightly so. Because good mothers should not only give birth, but should nourish protect, bring up, educate, train, disciple, set an example for, and we can talk about all the things that good mothers are supposed to do. So the church for us, God is our father. God begets us by incorruptible seed, but the earthly means he uses is the preaching of the word. 
and that he commits to his church. And so uh, I, I love the, the line here from Calvin, uh, although I think it would make a lot of people nervous. Mm -hmm. Certainly he who refuses to be a son of the church in vain desires to have God as, as his father. Uh, but then he supplies his reasons for it is only to the instrumentality of the church that we are born of God and brought up to the various stages of childhood and youth until we arrive at manhood. To say, I want God as my father, but I want nothing to do with the church because whatever. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. None of them's good enough for me. None of them has their doctor right. They all compromise at crucial points. You know, God didn't say anything about you should go to church if you can find a perfect one. <laughs> right. Or that it's one that's at least 90% correct or one that's 60% correct in most things and absolutely has to do this one thing or you're out of there. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, that one thing is confessing Jesus before. <laughs> right. um, you know, but that's not generally what it is. It's generally people pick on some yeah, They don't have enough issue. programs for my children. We don't have enough programs for our children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We sing hymns instead of um, praise contemporary songs. Christian music, praise songs. Or praise songs yeah. instead of hymns. <laughs> yeah, one way or the other. Um, you know, we, we, we've picked all kinds of things that are not key to our relationship with God. And people walk out of church over them all the time. You know, the preaching is too dry. The preaching is too emotional. The mm -hmm. preaching isn't doctrinal enough. The preaching is nothing but doctrine. We, we, we do all kinds of silly things. And the result is rarely that people move from one church and move to another and stay there. Mm -hmm. It usually becomes an excuse for rotating through churches one after another every year or two. And with no true submission to any one church. Mm -hmm. We become connoisseurs of churches, sampling them smorgasbord-like, finding the thing that meets our taste right now, but may not in a year or two when other situations come up. But if the church is our mother, would we treat our earthly mother that way? <laughs> would we rotate from household to household? Aunt Susie, will you be my mother this year? Because <laughs> my other mother is being kind of... Cheap with the uh, credit cards. Uh, oh, oh, but Aunt Susie, oh, Aunt Susie, you're going to get on me about my driving. Okay, well, maybe Aunt Mary will be my mother now. It's, <laughs> it's about that ridiculous sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's not having a mother. That's a failure to have a mother. Uh, there is a degree of commitment and submission to certainly the rule of the elders, but more specifically, more importantly, by far, the preaching message, preaching ministry of the gospel. Uh, is it the gospel that offends us? Uh, do we think that there is a better source of nourishment? You know, when when my girls were little, they generally liked what we gave them, but sometimes they would get fussy and not eat this particular baby food or that particular baby food or this flavor of it or that flavor of it. And we 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 cave in a little now and then. But when you start letting your baby set the menu, you've pretty well given up your place as mom. Uh, mom knows what's nourishing for babies. Babies don't. <laughs> and even young children often don't. Uh, the church feeds us. And one of the great responsibilities of pastors and elders is to make sure that the whole Bible is being presented, whether in the, the main service, in the preaching ministry, Bible studies, personal devotions, books that are being recommended. It becomes a responsibility of church officers to make sure that everyone's getting a well-rounded meal that will nourish them and build them up in faith. And as well, receiving the prayers and the love and the rebuke that will that will help them grow from babes in Christ to young men to to old wise men and women in the faith. That's what the church is supposed to do for us. It's supposed to be a source of uh, health, nourishment, encouragement, protection. When, when we have a problem, there should be no doubt. I, I, I call up my Christian friends, my Christian brothers and sisters. I call up the church officers. I call my pastor. I ask for prayer. I ask for counseling. I ask for intervention. I ask for meals. I ask for babysitting. I, they're, they're the people I turn to because they care about me. And it's their responsibility, a, a cheerful, joyful one, we hope, to take care of me and to nourish me. And the man, the woman who doesn't want that because it's too intrusive, too controlling, always telling me what to think and what to believe and criticizing my new trendy rationalistic beliefs, yeah, that's not that's not how this works. God, by making us his children, puts us in the context of this heavenly city, this 
whole podcast we call it halting towards zion and we've looked at it mostly this this new covenant church as a community a civilization a culture a city but community another way that the bible describes this is that of marriage and that of motherhood so these are other metaphors and images we need to draw into this um, when i was writing the original article for this i found uh randomly something a blog somewhere uh, i i assume brandy remington is a young woman because her because brandy ends with an i but that's maybe that's just my prejudices <laughs> And I don't know anything about her, her faith or worldview, but she writes this. An ideal, an ideal city would act as a mother to its residents, providing them with safety, support, guidance, esteem, and examples of how to navigate through life, allowing them to eventually operate on their own as strong leaders. About the only word there that I might qualify is esteem. If by that you mean, you mean a sense of identity, purpose, belonging. I know I'm a child of God. I know that God values me because of what Jesus has done, uh, that I'm not a nothing, and that I have a purpose in God's kingdom. All right, well, if, we, if that's what we mean. These are good things. This is what an ideal city should do. The problem, of course, is that we don't have any ideal cities on earth right now. <laughs> we don't even have a whole lot of good cities now. <laughs> um, th there was a time, I think, when, when various cities like Abel, Mecca, existed in terms of a godly culture and in over multiple generations have propagated such a culture and developed it and lived it out even in america early america i think there were such perhaps even on the frontier and in um, the westward expansion there were still some of this but it is fast receding the background cities now you, you try to describe a city as a place of of communion community of nourishing of of um support and guidance what san francisco la <laughs> really sacramento uh, in some cases the more they try to be the mother that supplies all care and nourishment the, the yeah. less they tend to do well at it <laughs> yeah because there are standards for these things right it is not enough for people to say i love you let me take care of you okay let's define love <laughs> let's, let's, let's have a standard of what you think is in fact loving and what taking care of might look like in practical instances and let us compare it against scripture. Our generation has become very bad at taking people at their word. If someone says that they love you, then you should submit to them because obviously we should trust them and, and they mean us well. And we should we should just, you know, go with it because they love us and we should accept them as they accept us totally and completely. And that's not biblical remotely because to have the church as our mother is to have God as our father. And God is pretty clear about what he wants from his children. Uh, God is father, the church is mother. It's not the other way around. And so, no, there's no co-divinity in heaven. There's not. <laughs> the, we get that the, question a lot from kids. If God is our father, is there? does he have a wife? Well, the answer is yes, but she's not another sense. goddess. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> she's not a goddess. It takes all of God's people together to constitute a bride for Jesus, to constitute the holy city, a temple fit for God. Not one or two or three or four, certainly not just one. <laughs> Will it be the Virgin Mary herself? There is no queen of heaven in an individual sense. There is the church, the bride, uh, the new Jerusalem. And that city rooted rooted in the work of Christ, but spread out through time and eternity, is basic to God's plan for his people. He, we are to acknowledge the role of the church. And, and there are, especially within American Christianity, it's probably the same elsewhere, but, you know, we, we Americans are very independent. And we don't want the dead past telling us what to do. We don't like traditions, and traditions can be dangerous. There are bad ones. but. Uh, and at this point, my girls might remind me of the uh, the parable of the ham. Ah, uh, yes, the ham. Yeah. The, you have to cut off the ham before you put it in the pan to go in the oven. Yeah. And when the little girl asked mom, why do we do that? She says, well, because your grandmother always did that. Well, why did she do it? I don't know. We probably should ask her. So when grandma's over, they say, well, why do you always cut off the, the ends of the ham? 
because when we were first married, we only had one pan and it was about this long. She had to cut off both ends of the ham to get it to fit. You know, there's nothing wrong with what she had done, but because somehow along the line, not everything had been communicated properly. And so <laughs> the stuff why was lost. had not been communicated. The why <laughs> had not been communicated. And often our traditions can be of that sort. They, they may actually have served a purpose at some point and then stop. But then other traditions are do have a why, do have a purpose. It is easily understandable. Uh, some of them are not absolutes. They're just good ideas and they become dangerous when we turn them into absolutes. And so we, we want to avoid moralisms. We want to avoid any authority, any absolute authority that is in scripture. But just as our own parents tell us things that we put into practice, generation after generation, pass that to our own kids, Christians of the past have had some pretty good ideas. <laughs> and, and they may not be infallible, but to think that we automatically are smarter than them just because we live later in the time stream is kind of arrogant. At the very least, we owe them the honor of listening and discerning what is wise, what is practical, with what degree we can implement that wisdom, even if we don't do it exactly the way they did it. There was a generation just to, just back two or three, a generation mostly, I think, just before mine or maybe two back, that decided that Christian education was a really, really good thing. And they were right. And they thought that Christian education should embrace all of culture and all of life, and it should be more than just public school education with some Bible verses attached and some spankings. And they were right. There were a lot of holes they left, and there were a lot of holes in the foundation, and a lot too uh, much too reliance on common grace mm -hmm. and on natural law, although they called it other things. <laughs> and so every every generation we have to rethink. But to go back to the drawing board every generation and assume that our our ancestors were idiots is to dishonor not only the church, but to dishonor God. Because those people were Christians too. They had the Bible. This and they had the, the Holy Spirit. And they had the Holy Spirit. This is the communion of the saints stretched mm -hmm. across all of time. And, and so as we come to the church as our mother, we need to understand that mom can tell us many wise things that we may not have to do exactly as she said, but that doesn't mean we don't listen and that we don't learn and that we don't build on the direction she's pointing. And to simply despise the church as we don't need the church then and worse, I don't need the church now is contrary to God's whole plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. So we will continue to halt towards Zion, <laughs> to limp like Jacob in search of that heavenly city, that new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem which is above, which is the mother of us all. And it's a hope that the things that we're doing here in this podcast will help people get a better cultural sense of what that what that means. So it's mm -hmm. not just religious words. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, I've recommended this before, but I'm reading it right now with my ninth grade American Lit students, and that is The Earth's Holocaust by Nathaniel Hawthorne. You mentioned that today, and I, yeah. I am not familiar with it at all. Yeah. It's, What's it about? Well, it's sort of a fairy tale. It begins once upon a time. And then Nathaniel Hawthorne says, but whether that was just recently or in the near future, I refuse to say, <laughs> in classic Hawthorne style. Yes. Um, but the, the tale is that he, he goes out to the Western Prairie where all of the world has decided to burn all of the things that are no longer useful. Mm. So they, they cast onto the fire patents of nobility and signs of old heraldry like we're 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 past that as as the human race we've moved past that and then they're like well we also are done with kings because we have this new empire in the new world right mm -hmm. and they go on and they burn alcohol and <laughs> weapons because we've grown past war and i mean obviously no one ever needed alcohol and right. <laughs> and they they go on and they're considering what else to burn. And then as they go, you know, someone who was really on board with burning alcohol realizes, wait, you want to burn my tobacco too? And <laughs> so the reform just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing until there's not much left. <laughs> so they get to the end and the fire is still burning. Um, oh, they've also burned all the books because oh, the past good. has nothing to teach us. Right. Um, and... Shakespeare burns brightest of all of all the books. They, mm. they, Nathaniel Hawthorne notes that American authors don't tend to burn very long. They just sort of 
turn into <laughs> ash very quickly, <laughs> except for a few things by Ellery Channing. Um, mm. mm-hmm. um, but in any case, they've they've burned everything and they get to the end and they're like, well, I, I guess that's it. There's nothing else left to burn. And a figure emerges who is all dark and has glowing red eyes. And we're thinking, oh, who could this be? Except that we're also reading the Scarlet Letter. So we know about the black man who lives in the forest, who's the devil. Right. And he says, <laughs> wasn't this fun? Too bad you can't get rid of the human heart. <laughs> and all of these evils still persist in the world because, yep, we still have the human heart. And that's where these things come. That's where evil and strife and war come from, not from the weapons and the gunpowder and all that stuff. <laughs> so anyway, it's a, it's a great read. It's... I think Nathaniel Hawthorne at his best from what I've read of him. So. Well, with the help of my wife and daughter, I have two musical recommendations that I think fit what we're talking about because one is the doxology, which is old <laughs> and simple and Trinitarian and reverent. The other was from Andre Crouch, I'm thinking To God Be the Glory. Which is modern and probably not something that will last through all time, but in my generation was a wonderful, enthusiastic outburst of joy at the greatness of God in in our salvation. No glory to me, all glory to God. So there's always something to sing. And what was once contemporary drifts quickly into the past and becomes history. And that doesn't mean, though, that we can't go back and appreciate older styles. I, I'm reminded of a of a cartoon I saw someplace. It's a, a worship leader with a guitar, obviously addressing his youth group or congregation or something. And uh, he's beginning to pluck at the strings. He says, I composed this last week, but I think it's still relevant. <laughs> church of what's happening now? Well, mm-hmm. the church is and was, and there are roots, and we need to appreciate all the fruits. And going back and realizing, no, we don't write songs like this anymore, and we don't sing songs like this anymore, does not mean that those songs are bad or that our songs are good. Mm -hmm. There are standards of excellence, and there are ways of appreciating things that may not be to our taste now, but once God's people used to glorify God, and there's still stuff to be learned from them. Yeah, my pastor was just talking about singing in his sermon on Sunday, who was in James, where mm-hmm. it says, if anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise or let him mm-hmm. sing psalms. Yeah. And he made the point that you can sing anywhere today. You can sing in your car and people will just think you're on a conference call. <laughs> so it is. It, it, it seems weird in today's culture, even to sing at all, let alone to sing by yourself. Yeah. But singing is wonderful. And I think it's a wonderful thing in the church to grow up surrounded by music. You go and you hear music every Sunday, yeah. um, and it's it's part of the rhythm of your life, and it's part of the mode of thinking that is shaped yeah. in you. And not only you hear music, you 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 sing. You sing it, so yeah. You're music. in it. <laughs> People who will not sing any other time, we hope, sing at church. Not always true, <laughs> sadly, but it's an opportunity that we should not pass on. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband, who at this moment is on a train from Bakersfield to Stockton, and I hope he gets there. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I will have a long drive and not much sleep tonight. In any case, thank you also to our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Thank you to our financial supporters for helping to keep the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. And if you'd like to get in touch with us for any reason, you can email us at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.